Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today for our last presentation in the Boys Town Virtual Newborn Expo. My name is Gabby here with Dr. Caitlin Gillespie. Dr. Gillespie, how are you today? I'm good, Gabby. Thanks for having me. Good. Well, thank you again for joining us. In case you missed it, we were actually live with Dr. Gillespie this past Monday on winter and seasonal baby care. So if you missed that, go ahead and go to the videos tab on our Facebook page and give that a watch. Today we are talking about the postpartum care and the postpartum experience for moms and parents alike. So this is a very important topic because I know a lot this past week we focused on baby and caring for baby, but it is just as important to care for you and maintain yourself as a priority as you welcome a new life into the world. So as we go through this discussion today, if you have questions for Dr. Gillespie, please leave them in the comment section of this video and we'll get them answered at the end. And also, if you are interested in winning a car seat from Boys Town Pediatrics, leave a comment too and you'll be entered to win this giveaway. Okay, so the first question is, what should expecting moms do now before baby is born to prepare for the postpartum experience? Perfect. Yes. Yeah, so I think this is a great place to start. This is one of those, a couple of different things that you can do just to make sure you're on the best starting point for when baby arrives, especially those first couple of weeks because it's a pretty busy, crazy time. Yeah. Um, so this is for moms, but also, you know, for support people and anything to just kind of help set the stage for bringing that new baby home. Um, so first thing would be just trying to get your to-do list done before baby arrives. Um, it is just so helpful to not have to worry about any of those things that you might need to do when you arrive home from the hospital. Um, and surprisingly, you'll have a lot less free time than you think you do, even though the baby is sleeping typically between 16 and 18 hours a day. Um, so one of the main things parents, I think, worry about is the nursery or the baby's room and getting that set up. Um, if it's not done when the baby arrives, that is OK, because for the most part, with the safe sleeping space that you have, as long as that's in your room, it doesn't need to be done for a little while. A lot of times families don't have their newborns in the nursery right away. But if you have the time to do it, it is so nice to not have to worry about getting it done um, after baby arrives. Another thing that is very simple, but this ha this was something my husband and I are like, okay, absolutely in the future, house chores. Again, if it's not done before the baby comes, it's fine. But worrying about things like sweeping or piles of laundry, things that need to be done, um, they can be done when baby gets there, but it's usually during your downtime and that really cuts into your time to rest and that time for self-care, which we'll talk about more in a bit, but very important. Um, so kind of those things, just trying to set the stage. Another thing I would recommend is preparing a postpartum kit. So I really didn't know about this as a first time mom, but this is something one of my co-resident moms helped me out with during residency. Mm -hmm. And this made a huge difference for me. And I definitely recommend it to all first time moms. And I recommend it to friends all the time. So we're just going to run through some basic supplies, yeah. um, most common supplies that most mamas will need during the recovery period. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the main things, it's, it's called a peri bottle. It's essentially like a water bottle, a squirt bottle. But after delivery, we really try to avoid wiping like we normally would when we use the restroom. It's better. It's a lot less painful. Um, but you can use this with warm water just to cleanse the area. I have a couple of examples. This is something hospitals typically send home. So it's just kind of this yeah. really basic squirt bottle that you would have. Um, there are other varieties you can buy like this one. It like still works upside down. Oh, so you don't nice. have to worry about it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so those are some examples, but that's going to be the main way that we're, you know, when we use the restroom, we're using peri bottles rather than our traditional wiping that we're used to. Um, so the other thing that can be really helpful is just plain old washcloths. So used in place of normal toilet paper, you blot dry after rinsing with the peri bottle. It's okay to use toilet paper if that's what you have at home, but just a little less messy. This is something I didn't really consider. Um, so we just ordered like a bunch of just like plain standard yeah. Amazon Clause. It is what they give you in the hospital too. And so that's one of those things where it was like, oh man, I'm at the hospital. I don't have any of these things at home. Right. Um, so not something you must have, but if you have some of them, it can make things a lot easier. You can just throw them in the washing machine on hot with bleach, whatever, throw them away when you're done. Um, but something really nice to have. Another thing that you will get some of at the hospital, but will likely need more of is pads with either disposable hospital underwear or a type of brief that has both of those things. So after delivery, you should expect continued bleeding or discharge. This is called lochia. Um, it's very the common postpartum bleeding and discharge, typically four to six weeks after delivery. So it can be for quite a long time. Um, so you need 
kind of an abundance of those supplies. It's definitely stuff that you can stock up on as you need more, but it's nice to have them already at home, knowing that you might need them for four to six weeks. Mm -hmm. Um, So you can wear normal underwear if you're comfortable, but if you want disposable options or larger options for more coverage to accommodate pads and different things, that's something to look into too. Um, Another thing with the pads and then maybe disposable briefs of some sort is that you might have some urinary issues after delivery as well. So whether that's leaking or accidents from delivery, sometimes um, with an epidural for anesthesia, you might have some kind of slowing of your your bladder. So it takes a little bit of time to wake up. And so briefs that contain a pad of some kind can be really helpful, especially when you're having more of like that overflow incontinence if your bladder is kind of asleep. Mm -hmm. Um, So that just kind of takes the guesswork out of that and is much easier to clean up. Um, So a couple of options for those things, let's see. Um, So the hospital will give you something that's kind of like these. They're really cute. I know. But they're essentially just really stretchy, kind of like brief underwear. Um, And then typically what they use is just like maxi pads that you would put in those for that Lokia. And you can do that at home, the duration that however long you need them, you can switch out to a thinner pad if things are kind of easing up, if you're not having as much of a problem with that Lokia. And then there are another option. Um, a lot of these that are almost like more for like adult, like adult briefs, but essentially yeah. like a brief has the pad already in it. Mm. Um, so then you can kind of put it on like it would be underwear and just saves you that extra step of trying to make sure that everything's in there where it's supposed to be and not moving around. Mm-hmm. Um, so all of those are good things to have at home, especially since you'll need them for usually a couple of weeks, at least after delivery. Another big one is either numbing spray, like Dermoplast or Tux pads or Witch Hazel products. So all of them kind of do the same thing. Um, they're very helpful if you have any hearing or discomfort from your vaginal delivery. Um, there's also normal itching that occurs with healing from those things. Um, also very helpful for hemorrhoids, which are a common problem during the third trimester and following vaginal deliveries. Um, just kind of like itching and discomfort. Dermoplast is something that they typically give you in the hospital. It looks like this. Mm-hmm. Um, and it is just a kind of cool comfort spray um, that you can use when you're having difficulty. It's also something that you can just incorporate into your bathroom routine whenever you use the bathroom. So you'll have, kind of come up with a routine that you do every single time, um, which seems very excessive, but it's something that we do for this short period of time in the postpartum period. Yeah. Um, another popular one is these tux pads. So they're a witch hazel based product as mm-hmm. well. Um, and then Frida. So you might've heard of Frida products from um, baby stuff, but they also have a line called Frida Mom. And they have a lot of these products that are available and some of them that even come in a kit. So you can kind of get them all together and have them there together. They also have a witch hazel product um, that you can kind of put on in with your pads. um, Mm -hmm. They're all thinner, but are the same general active ingredient to help with that healing and itching. Um, So any of those are okay. Like I said, dermoplast you typically can get from the hospital. You might need more of it at home. Um, so it might be nice to have a backup or if you want to try any of those other products. Yeah. Um, a really important piece for postpartum care is ice packs. Um, you might have friends or family members who have referred to them as pad sickles. Um, I had a couple of people tell me about those, but icing is so important in those first few days, especially after a vaginal delivery. Um, it's very common to have swelling of those tissues, um, sometimes even bruising related to delivery. Um, so regular icing early on can really help minimize that swelling. And that swelling is one of the major reasons why we get pain in that area. Mm-hmm. Um, especially when you're in the hospital, you're doing most of your time sitting, sitting upright or laying flat. And so that becomes a dependent area where swelling just is likely to happen. So icing really cuts down on that. It can help with pain, especially if we manage it right away. Um, so there's a lot of different options. You can do reusable ice packs. There are some that they make that you can put in your freezer, use and clean and then refreeze. Um, ice diapers are something that they talk about in the hospital. So it's actually using one of your newborn's diapers. They'll sh- mm. A lot of the postpartum nurses are great about this. So they'll show you, you open up uh, the tab in the back, you kind of rip it and then fill it with ice. Mm. And then the diaper actually absorbs it as it's melting, which is really slick. Um, and then pad sickles, we kind of talked about, it's essentially those same maxi pads, but you can put them, put water in them and then freeze them. So they do use the same function. Um, and some people even include things like the witch hazel on that or like different tea bags. Like a lot of, a lot of um, not first time moms have specific remedies that work really well for them. So if you have any friends recommending that, that is something that you'll commonly see. Mm-hmm. Um, 
The next thing that um, I didn't really think about, but that they use in the hospital are chucks pads or kind of like protectors. Um, it's something that you commonly see in healthcare, um, like a barrier or a blanket that helps with cleaning. And so a lot of times in the hospital, right after delivery, you have those in your hospital bed. You might be using them on chairs or things because you wanna prevent your furniture or your bedding or anything like that from getting any leaking or discharge or anything on them. Um, so they're very basic. They're kind of just like a simple pad and then they have cotton on them. Um, so this might be something that you like put on the nursery chair in the room if you're gonna be nursing or you keep it in your bed with you for a couple of days just to make sure things are going okay. Um, and then they can do double duty because you can use them over your, your diaper pads. You can put them in the diaper bag. You use them as kind of just a, a clean area that you can use. Um, so they, they are very effective for multiple different things. Um, one of the biggest things kind of moving into the next topic would be medicine. And so in the hospital, moms are typically on a pretty, um, regimented protocol for what we're doing pain control wise. And that kind of goes along with the icing too, right after delivery is when you're at the risk for most pain. And so, um, if you typically have normal over the counter pain meds, that's fine. Um, some people might need additional pain meds, depending on if they had a C-section delivery or a, or a difficult vaginal delivery. And so take those medicines as your doctor would recommend too. But I would recommend keeping on top of that scheduled pain management after discharge, especially during those first few days to help you stay on top of your pain. So the medicines that you'll typically have in the hospital are Tylenol, ibuprofen, and then Colace, which is a stool softener. And the reason why that is recommended is just to make sure that everything is smooth and less painful as we're going through those first couple of days during the postpartum period when there is quite a bit of swelling and pain in that area. Um, and like we said, if there's any you know extra medicines that you have from a C-section or from other delivery complications, take those as prescribed by your doctor as well. Um, a lot of moms, um, a lot of people in general don't like taking scheduled medicines if they don't have to. I would highly recommend staying on top of these, especially in those first couple of days to make sure that we're having the best recovery possible. Um, and as far as specific C-section supplies, I did ask around, I did not have a C-section, um, but the moms that I talked to said most of the same stuff that we already talked about. And then in addition, those same large maxi pads and a kind of wrap that you would wrap around. You essentially use that pad across your C-section incision mm -hmm. to help things clean and dry and then would wrap with either like an ACE wrap or Coban or anything else that's kind of a mesh sleeve that would go around your abdomen to hold it in place. Um, so that would be an important thing to have if you if you have a planned C-section um, or, or something to think about if you're coming home and you don't have those supplies. And then as far as location, it might be helpful to have multiple kits already set up if you have multiple bathrooms um, on different floors. Um, mine essentially I had in just like one of these little kits from, yeah. I think I got at Walmart with the little handles and then you could take it wherever you wanted to. You could put it away in a drawer if people were coming over and you didn't want all of your stuff just sitting in your bathroom. Um, or you can just keep it in your bathroom if there's one bathroom that you're going to be using so that it's easily accessible while you're in the bathroom. Yeah. Um, that was a lot of information, but I feel like as a first time mom, that was a lot of stuff I did not know. And it was very beneficial to have someone kind of steer me in that right direction of having that. Yeah. Um, so those are supplies for mom. Things that probably are lower on our list when we're thinking about bringing a new baby home, but maybe some of the most important stuff to have ready. Yeah. Um, in terms of supplies for the baby, there are a couple of must have things, but a lot of them are things that we'll use later on. Maybe we can get, maybe we'll still be getting gifts, um, those kinds of things. So as far as when the baby comes home, there are a couple of things that you should have ready for them. So basic onesies, footy pajamas, if that's what you want, um, whether you're going to do sleep gowns, whatever you're going to have the baby in for the most part in the day. And very simple white onesies are totally fine, whether they're long sleeve or short sleeve based on the season that you're having the baby. Um, you'd also want a hat, which you do have the one from the hospital, but another one might be helpful too, as heat kind of escapes from the baby's head. And you want to make sure if they're feeling cold that you have a hat on them, but not when sleeping. Mm -hmm. And then any swaddles, whether that's a swaddle cloth or a safe sleep sack, or one of those swaddle sacks that we talked about on Monday, where you put them in the sack and then swaddle them with the Velcro. Um, you want to have one of those ready. Maybe two, because one of the other things you'll have with baby is a lot of laundry, um, whether that's from spitting up or from blowouts or anything like that. So it's nice to have backups as well. Um, which kind of moves us to the next important thing, diapers, wipes, and then either Aquaphor, Desitin, some kind of cream if you need it. It's nice to have 
all of those things available. Babies typically go through anywhere between eight and 15 diapers in a day. Um, average would be about 10. So you wanna have a good supply of diapers there at home. You're gonna be using quite a bit of them very frequently. Um, as far as a safe sleep space, that can be either a bassinet or a pack and play. There are some things marketed called a floor blocks. Um, you can use the crib. There are a lot of options, but it should just be a firm, flat surface, typically in mom and dad's room initially. Um, some families might prefer to have baby in the crib in the nursery, and that is okay too. But typically what you're going to do is have the baby at the bedside and you just need a safe space for them to sleep. Um, you wanna know kind of what your plan is for a changing station, whether you're going to have an actual station with all of those diaper supplies, or if you're gonna be kind of moving it around where you have pads where you can put them on the floor. Any of those things are okay. You just wanna kind of know what your plan is for changing those diapers. Um, I would recommend saline. So like saline nose drops, or um, they also have little misters as well as suction. So you have the bulb suction that you would get from the hospital. The other option are kind of the nasal aspirators. So nose frita is a very popular one. Um, but newborns are often congested or have nasal secretions after vaginal delivery, after all delivery. It's very common. So it's nice to have a way to clean out their nose if you notice that they sound very stuffy, especially during these winter months. Um, you would want an infant bathing tub of some kind. Now, babies are not going to be taking baths very frequently. And until their um, umbilical cord, their stump falls off, you're just going to be doing um, kind of washcloth baths for those first usually one to two weeks. Um, so you don't have to have it right away, but it is nice to have because baby is not going to be able to be in your normal tub or even the sink without special support. Um, so th that's something important to have at home. A nail file or clippers, um, there is no one best option, but some newborns are born with very long, sharp fingernails that can scratch very easily, both themselves while they'll be scratching their face as they're trying to get comfortable or mom or dad. Um, our baby was like that. I had just like a French manicure at birth and um, we had to figure out how to do that. And so the, the nail file was actually something that was really helpful for us. There's no one right way to do it, but it might be beneficial to have that at home already because typically um, that's something that you're going to take care of. They won't usually take care of at the hospital. Mm -hmm. um, this is not a must have, but it was a must have for us. Some kind of a noise machine or shusher. Yeah. There are a lot of different options. We had a hatch that we really liked. Um, gives you that nice background noise. So something we still use now with our toddler, but at the time it also just helped kind of the noises that she would make overnight help us get better sleep. Um, a shusher is another device where it's not specific sounds. It's just that whoosh, whoosh, whoosh noise over and over again. Just kind of helps soothe baby during nap time if you're there not in the room or during sleep times. And then also provides an extra layer of just kind of white noise for parents as the baby is sleeping next to them in the room. Some babies are very, very loud sleepers. Very yeah. loud. Um, and then the last thing, um, there are lots of other things that you could have on this list, but whether you're breastfeeding or formula feeding, I think would be those supplies that you need in order to feed the baby. Um, for breastfeeding, it would be whatever pump that you're planning to use. Though so for establishing breastfeeding, a lot of moms won't use their pump right away, but it is nice to know what your plan is and sometimes already have it. So you're not worrying about that later on. Um, there's also something called the Haka, which is a silicone kind of uh, hand express pump that works based on suction. It's really helpful when you're first establishing milk supply because you can put it onto the breast you're not nursing on and it can help drain milk without baby feeding. There's also milk saver cups. Haka has some. There are a lot of different brands that you would put in your nursing bra so it collects milk on the opposite side of your nursing so you're not wasting that milk. Mm -hmm. That's something especially early on as mom is establishing her milk supply that is a common issue that it is seen. So a lot of leaking and drainage and then essentially milk that's lost that could be could be kept and put in the fridge. Um, other things would be nipple creams or balms. There are a lot out there. Usually you want ones that are um, not a lot of different ingredients um, and pretty generic for sensitive skin. Gel soothies are another thing. Um, they're something you put in the fridge and then can put over the nipple um, after your nursing to help kind of protect it and then also soothe it if it is uncomfortable. A lot of times that happens um, as you're establishing nursing. And then boppy or another kind of pillow for positioning just to make sure that you're nice and supported as you're getting that perfect latch um, with your newborn. So that's for our breastfeeding supplies for breastfeeding moms. For formula feeding moms, you'll need a basic infant formula. I know some of my colleagues this week talked about infant and newborn feeding, um, but some of the very standard brands are Infamils, NeuroPro, Similac Advance, and there are a lot of generic um, kind of brand grocery store formulas that are common starting options as well, whether that's Target 
or Aldi or Walmart, everyone has their kind of first starting option. And they are all essentially the same in terms of the nutritional content that they have because they're all mimicking breast milk. Um, so you would want to have formula there as well as a bottle system. And you might need to try a couple of varieties before you find one that your infant likes best. Um, a lot of common first brands are like the Avent brand, Dr. Brown's, Komotomo. There are a lot of different brands. Um, so you can ask around for friends or family what they like. Those are some of the common ones that we see. Um, I know Milkworks here in town also recommends the just straight Walmart parent choice brand. Um, they have a lot of success for that, especially for breastfeeding babies. Um, so those are all options, but you might have to try a couple before you find one that, that your baby really likes. So it might be nice to invest in some samples before you buy a whole system um, to try and figure out what your baby needs. Um, and then a bottle warmer, not a must have. You can definitely just do warm water in a cup on the sink, but it does save you some time and can speed up the yeah. process. So it's something to consider. Um, that was a really long list of things to do, things to get ready. Um, but I think it that. is really cool to have all of that ready so that you can focus on these next things that we're gonna talk about and yeah. not all of those things. Yeah. Um, so it sounds like a lot, and I guess it is a lot, especially if you're like, okay, I need to get all this done. But then once it's done, you get to focus on these other things that we're going to talk about. Yeah, I love it. And thank you, too, for showing those visual examples. I think it's so nice to see them as you're talking about them. Um, someone did ask if we could have a checklist to print off. So I will go ahead after this video. I'll work up a little graphic with some of the things Dr. Gillespie talked about, and I can share that into the newborn, newborn event page for you guys, too, to save. So yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. And then also with some of the postpartum things that you showed, would you recommend some moms bring those to the hospital or should they kind of rely on what the hospital gives them and then have those at home or what would you do? Yeah. So typically, I mean, and it, I guess it kind of depends on where you're delivering. And those are good questions to ask your OB as well if you have questions about that, because they should know at the hospital or whatever your care, wherever you're delivering or whoever your care provider is should know. Um, kind of what to expect in terms of that hospital stay. For the most part, other than um, the things you pack for your hospital bag, like your robe, your comfies, your toiletries, those kinds of things, the hospital should be providing those things. Um, and they usually, um, whatever is kind of in your room that you haven't used, they let you take those things home with you. It's just that for a lot of them, you're gonna need them for a lot longer than their supply will allow. So the dermaplast, maybe a can you could get away with, um, but you're not gonna have enough maxi pads, disposable underwear, those kinds of things that will last you through the period you might need them. So they don't expect you to bring those things to the hospital. Um, definitely a good question to ask, but it's nice to have them all at home ready to go because you likely will need them. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Okay, so we got the, like you said, the pre stuff done. Now going into <laughs> post baby. So how old is your daughter now? Remind me. She is um, 15 months old. 15 months. Okay, so you're not too far away from this postpartum experience. So no. congrats. And we, we'd love to know, I'm sure the viewers would love to know too, how did you take time for yourself after your baby was born? Yeah, I'm really glad. And I'm glad we're talking about this during this week because this is a really important piece of this kind of newborn period and postpartum period. But honestly, at first, I feel like I didn't. Um, it was really difficult to find balance. So there are a lot of overwhelming pieces of becoming a new parent. And I personally felt like I was being pulled in a lot of different directions in terms of my responsibilities. So we have a new baby. We have our other family members. We have work and being away from work, all of those kinds of things. Um, that are kind of floating around in a new mom's mind, really a new parent's mind. Um, so it looks different, I feel like, for every mom. Um, and I'm going to touch on a couple of the self-care tips here. Um, but I think in terms of taking care of yourself, the most important piece is figuring out how to take that time, um, especially like we talked about, we're trying to figure out, okay, we have all this time, we're going to get all this stuff done beforehand that we can. But how do we get that time? Because it feels like there's never enough time when you have a newborn. Um, so some of the tips for finding time for yourself would be just being honest in communication with your support people, whoever those might be, whether that's your significant other, family members, friends, coworkers. If you need time for yourself, um, let people know that so they can be there to help you. You don't have to do it all. So try and fight that urge. Um, it's really appealing to try and get all of the little things done when the baby is sleeping or when you have some other downtime. But ultimately, that means you didn't get 
to take a break to take care of yourself. Um, and that can really wear on you over time. And it doesn't, it doesn't take much time. Um, those first couple of weeks are, can be pretty difficult. Um, so it's really important to prioritize your needs. So if it comes down to doing the dishes or taking a shower, pick the shower, pick the shower every time. Um, but it includes things like taking a nap, getting out of the house to run a personal errand, or just doing something fun casually with a friend, um, getting a massage, whatever. I had plenty of people tell me the dishes and the laundry will still be there. They will wait. You won't get the time back with baby. You won't get that time for yourself back either, and it'll be okay. So just make sure you're taking care of you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's definitely true. So when it comes to body image, many mothers feel kind of out of their own skin after giving birth. What advice do you have for that time? Yeah, it is. it can definitely be a challenge to process all of the changes that a new mom has to her body. So we kind of get used to that with pregnancy a little bit. Um, things are changing. So it can include things like weight change and changes to your breasts, skin changes and stretch marks. Um, a lot, one of the things that's really common after pregnancy is hair loss, mm -hmm. um, swelling in your hands and feet, changes in your proportions overall. So they're all very common, um, all things most moms are experiencing. So it's really important just to try and give yourself grace. Um, just remember that it took nine months for your body to grow this brand new, beautiful baby. So it's going to take time for things to transition back. Um, we'll, we'll touch on this in a little bit here, but the postpartum period is technically the first 12 months after baby is born. So that whole year is considered the postpartum period. It's going to take some time um, to get things a little bit different than maybe they are right now, but it's also very likely that your body will never go back to exactly how it was before. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. Um, you also didn't have a baby before and now you have a baby. So life is just going to be different and that's okay. And I think it's hard for, for new moms to come to terms with that. It's just, it's a big transition, but there's lots of us doing it and we're all here to support each other. So it's important to remember that. Um, I think this is something especially true for breastfeeding moms. So some moms notice that when they're breastfeeding, it really helps them maybe shed extra weight from the baby quickly. Other breastfeeding moms might note the opposite and they might notice significant decreases in their milk supply when they try to lose weight, um, especially with any calorie restriction or trying to diet. It's all very normal, but it can be frustrating. Um, so giving yourself that grace that things will get there eventually, it's just going to take some time is super important. And I think the last thing is just finding clothes that make you feel good. Um, so whether that's like fresh, new, comfy clothes that you're going to be spending all your time and at home with your new baby. So that would be like good nursing bras, perfect sweatpants. Mm -hmm. um, I lived in my fluffy robe for yeah. weeks, um, good cozy socks, or even just a couple of new pieces that make you feel like pretty and put together when you're out and about. Because one of the things that's really hard is that it can be really stressful and disappointing to put on your old clothes, so yeah. things that you were used to wearing, and see how differently they feel and fit and look. Um, so obviously you don't get rid of them, but you just give yourself some time, you put them away for a while and you find things that do make you feel good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. So how can parents relieve their stress when it all becomes a lot after welcoming a baby, especially just as you noted, you know, it's, it's a full year, that postpartum period, and there's going to be a lot of stressful moments during that time. So, you know, because of the lack of sleep, for example, Many parents do become irritable, which is totally fine, totally normal. What tips do you have for managing the waves of emotion due to lack of sleep? Yes, I'm glad we're like we're kind of putting this all together because one of those things I think that really contributes to stress in general in the postpartum period is that lack of sleep. Like the two of them together just make things much more stressful than you would have maybe imagined. So prioritizing sleep is huge, especially for like making sure that you're able to relieve your stress appropriately. Um, so sleep changes really take a toll both on your physical and your mental health. And it's really easy to think we kind of talked about this. I'll get this done. Um, I'll get this done right now and maybe I won't take this nap. But especially early on, it's so important to make sure you're getting as much sleep as you can during the day to make up for those newborn sleep changes. Um, and so especially for first time parents, I think you know that your sleep is going to be different, but you don't really know what to expect. And so I like to kind of talk with parents. It's very important to know what is normal for a newborn sleeping. So newborns normal is that they're often more awake at night and asleep during the day. So that's different from what we're doing. We're like, oh, we can get these things done, but then they're going to be more awake at night. And that's when the sleep, sleep deprivation is going to take a toll. So newborns sleep more than us. Usually, like we said, 
anywhere between 14 and 18 hours a day, usually 16 to 18. Um, but their sleep is very erratic and random compared to ours. So they might sleep for several hours at a time, then be awake for 30 minutes to 60 minutes, um, transition back to sleep. And that will happen overnight as well. So it's not the same kind of chunks of sleep that we're used to. Um, and also it'll be weeks, if not months, before there's any real schedule for your newborn. Um, and even then it'll fluctuate from day to day. Baby kind of runs the show in terms of when baby is going to sleep and wants to be awake. Um, so schedule, it's really hard to wrap your head around the fact that there is no specific schedule um, for you to follow in terms of your sleep as well. Um, and then as far as feeding, so newborns go anywhere between two to four hours overnight. Um, no baby should go longer than four hours until they're back to birth weight. And for breastfed babies, it's not uncommon. They want to cluster feed while your milk supply is kind of starting out, um, especially for those first six weeks. So they might want to be eating every you know, 30 to 60 minutes for a couple of hours in the wee hours of the morning. So all of these things contribute to what we already know is going to be stressful. That's what newborn sleep looks like. And so that's why whenever you're tired or you have downtime and you want to sleep, sleep. Yeah. Always prioritize sleep. Mm -hmm. um, another really important thing is asking for help when you need it. We kind of talked about this before with just open communication, but if you're stressed out or struggling, let your support people know that so you can get that extra time for yourself. Um, cause from a stress and kind of like mood perspective, it's very important to communicate what is going on with you to those people, but also to whoever your provider is, whether that's an OB or a nurse midwife, whoever's taking care of you so that you can get resources and help that you need if that stress is becoming too much. Mm -hmm. um, so communication, very important during this process. Um, another thing I like to recommend is getting outside. That can be really hard in the Midwest this time of year, um, but especially those first few weeks, every day almost feels like Groundhog Day. You're doing this yeah. same thing. It's a little bit different, but almost the same every day of feeding and then changing and then sleeping and then repeating the same thing. So that sunlight and fresh air, light aerobic activity, as you can tolerate, can really do a lot for your stress and mood. Um, and so if you're still recovering from delivery and having trouble getting around, even just sitting outside, if you can, for a little bit to just kind of re-equilibrate to your surroundings is very helpful. Um, if the temperature allows, you can bring baby on a walk with you too, if you want to get outside, making mm -hmm. sure we, we bundle appropriately if it's cold, but then in those warmer months, everyone going outside together to get those, those benefits from fresh air. Um, and then another thing that's really important that will kind of lead us into our next topic is just identifying what self-care is for you because it is not a one-size-fits-all thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we'll go into that next question. So sometimes when we think of self-care, you know, self-care Sunday, as some say, we think of taking a bubble bath, doing an eye mask, face mask, whatever it may be. Um, but it's so much more than that, you know? So how can moms and, uh, and parents in general take care of their mental and physical health after giving birth? Yes, absolutely. So pampering definitely is self-care. So absolutely do those things yeah. if that is something you like to do. Sometimes as a new mom, that is really just getting the chance to take a long, hot shower. And that is self-care and you feel great. Makes a huge difference. But it could be a bubble bath, a face mask, painting your nails, um, doing something new with your hair, or going to the salon and freshening up your hair if you want, whatever you need to feel refreshed, that totally counts in terms of self-care. Um, I think another important piece is just focusing on what re-energizes you. Mm -hmm. So this will be different for everyone, but, and that might be you're watching a favorite show or a movie or spending time on a hobby that you enjoy. So crafts or music or cooking or reading, something that you really like. Um, maybe spending time with friends. So getting out of the house alone for a bit, whether that's with friends or by yourself, just to do something, um, just something that makes you feel refreshed and kind of refills your cup um, is super important to identify and make sure that you're doing that um, just for your own self-care. Um, I think something from the physician standpoint in me is just focusing on your nutrition and your fluids. This is so, so, so important after delivery. Um, during the postpartum period, and especially for breastfeeding moms. Um, so your body is recovering from this very significant physical trauma almost, and needs to be nourished to recover well. So most hospitals in terms of fluids will give you a big water jug to help you with hydration. Mine is right here. Yeah. I spit through that. The best. It's my that side. I'm going to take a sip right now. Actually. Yeah. You've been talking a lot. You're good. I have been talking a lot. Um, <laughs> So they'll give you that, and I obviously still use mine, but you want to make sure you're meeting those fluid goals. Um, most mamas should be drinking between two and three liters of water a day, so about two of those. That will be about 60 to 70 ounces. Um, 
And it's even more important for breastfeeding moms. They might even need more. Mm -hmm. We as grownups are notoriously bad at meeting our fluid intake goals regularly. So this is something we really focus on in the postpartum period for our recovery and for our breast milk supply. Um, nutrition is also super important for healing and recovery and especially important for establishing breastfeeding. You need those calories in order to make milk. Um, so it's all similar concepts that we would say for everyday nutrition recommendations, focusing on fruits and veggies, whole grains, healthy fats, whether that's like nuts or nut butters or avocado or cooking things in extra virgin olive oil, all of those things you want to still focus on. Um, you might also have postpartum cravings similar to what you had during pregnancy. Um, for me, it was peanut butter, like on the spoon, right out of the jar and granola. Yeah. Um, they're both very, fairly high calories. So that was kind of like, okay, maybe my body is telling me that I need these calories. Um, which was one of those things kind of too, we're talking body weight. I, I didn't gain weight during that time, but I didn't lose any weight during that time. And kind of just like, okay, this is what we're doing. Like this is yeah. what my body wants to do. Um, especially postpartum, this is not the time to diet. Um, it's really important to listen to your body. And if you're hungry, you eat, um, you need to give your body that time to recover before you attempt to cut back. And I've said this a couple of times now, but especially if you're, if you're breastfeeding, if you're working on establishing your milk supply, um, as things go on, this will be kind of trial and error. What can you try and cut back on? But especially for moms after return to work, if you're not exclusively breastfeeding, it becomes pretty apparent early on if milk supply is going to change based off of your caloric intake. Mm -hmm. um, you will see dips in supply and you just kind of have to readjust. Um, in terms of nourishing your body, supplements are also important. Um, you should be taking anything that your OB has recommended your care provider. Um, but typically we say whatever you are taking during pregnancy, you should continue during that postpartum period, especially if it's prenatal vitamin, iron, extra folate, those kinds of things. You might want to start additional vitamin D supplementation, but you don't have to. Um, here in the Midwest in the winter months, pretty much anyone, if you tested us, would be deficient in vitamin D. Um, mom, breastfeeding moms, especially if you take 6,000 international units daily, that should transfer to be an appropriate amount of vitamin D in your breast milk for baby. Um, so that is another common reason that we would recommend, um, vitamin D supplementation. Yeah. Awesome. So going into hormonal changes, what should pregnant mothers know going into birth about all those hormonal changes that happen? Yes. So <laughs> they are significant. Um, so if you, not everyone has pregnancy, pregnancy symptoms the same way, but if you had noticeable pregnancy symptoms, so nausea or headaches or hot flashes or fatigue, you've already experienced a little bit of this, but there is a big change in your hormones after your baby is born as well. Almost immediately after birth, your estrogen and progesterone start to decline and then oxytocin and prolactin start to increase. So it happens almost immediately after delivery. And so typically within that first week, you will notice a very significant change and it is normal. Um, so those often include mood fluctuations, hot flashes, night sweats, those kinds of things. Um, all very normal, but something that is an expected part of that postpartum process. Mm -hmm. What should pregnant mothers be aware of in regards to postpartum depression? What are the signs to look for? Maybe we can describe what it is too and what help is available. Yeah, for sure. I'm really glad we're talking about this because this is a common question that um, expecting parents have. It's also a very common thing to see. And so um, more often than not, some of these symptoms will occur after a baby is born for most moms. Um, so just to kind of briefly review postpartum symptoms related to mood, like we said, the postpartum period is technically the first 12 months after birth. So any time within that first 12 months would be in the postpartum period. Um, one thing we talk about is postpartum blues or baby blues. Um, what that looks like is usually kind of like a mild, transient kind of picture of depression, essentially. So maybe you don't quite feel like your normal self. Maybe you're having trouble sleeping. Um, maybe you have some kind of waves in your emotions. We call that emotional lability. So you're kind of up and down and all over the place. Having difficulty concentrating, those are very common symptoms with the postpartum blues. Um, and they typically develop around day two to three after delivery and then reach a peak around kind of that first week and then resolve typically within two weeks of delivery. Um, so multiple studies have looked at this and indicate up to 40% of women experience these symptoms. So almost half of moms after they have a baby will have this kind of subset of symptoms and that is normal. Mm -hmm. um, so 
It's not one of those things where you're going to say, oh, this is what it is. A lot of moms have this. It's so you don't feel alone. A lot of people have these symptoms and it's very important to notice this in yourself, but then also communicate with your support people. Maybe even before baby comes, hey, this is what this looks like. And if you see this or if you're concerned about me, I want to know about it and I want I want you to help me figure this out. Um, Postpartum depression in context to the baby blues um, is more like about 10% um, in the United States population. So one in 10 moms will have postpartum depression, not just the baby blues. And the criteria for diagnosis for this are the same as it is for normal depression. Um, There's a set of symptoms that we look at and it has to be consistent over a two week period um, or longer um, to qualify for that diagnosis. Um, A lot of them are the same that we would see with baby blues in terms of the symptoms that you're having. Um, And then the really important one is if you're having any recurrent thoughts about death or any suicidal ideation, um, thoughts that you want to hurt yourself, um, that really separates this from baby blues. So that is something to to be talking about with support people if those are are thoughts that you're having. Um, There's also other mood related um, things that we see with pregnancy um, after that postpartum period. So postpartum anxiety, some people will have, um, postpartum PTSD. If they had traumatic, um, events happening with their birth or their delivery, there's something called postpartum psychosis. There's a lot of things that can happen, um, in terms of mental health concerns, following delivery. Um, especially if there are certain things that happened around that time of delivery that were extra stressful. Mm -hmm. Um, some of those tips for those postpartum mood changes, there's just knowing your risks. Um, there are several risks that make you maybe more at an increased risk than other moms, um, during that period. And so the most significant risk factor is if you have a past history of postpartum depression, or if you have any history of underlying depression outside of that pregnancy postpartum period, um, other risk factors, there are a lot of them, but like we said, stressful life events surrounding a pregnancy. So changes in family dynamics, moving, any of those things, a lack of social or financial support. Um, Young moms are more at risk. So if you're less than 25 years old, um, single parents, um, if there's a family history of postpartum depression or other mental health disorders, um, if you have an anxious personality or a history of anxiety, that sets you up at more of a risk. Um, And then there are other stresses that kind of contribute even after baby is there. So childcare stresses, um, difficult if your infant is colicky or you're having any of those issues, the season of delivery. So right now, moms that are expecting, like we said in the Midwest, that vitamin D um, portion of kind of mood and affecting mood, um, we do see seasonal affective disorder, which is essentially depression symptoms during the winter months. And that can contribute as well if you're a mom who's, who's looking to deliver here soon. So like I said, there are lots of risk factors. And the main point is just identifying what yours are. And if you have several or many, um, this might put you at a higher risk. So even more important to have those conversations with your support people. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is, we've talked about this kind of throughout these themes, but education and honest communication is so important for reducing the risk of complications with postpartum depression. So discussing those mood changes that occur after delivery with your support people, letting them know if you're struggling and encouraging them to bring it to your attention if they are noticing things um, that they're concerned about for you. And again, it's very important to include your healthcare provider in this conversation as well, um, because they might want to see you sooner than planned to discuss those symptoms and maybe determine what steps need to be taken. Um, so it's very important to reach out to them if you're having any of these issues. Um, as far as screening, both your OB and pediatrician should be screening you for postpartum depression and anxiety at your follow-up visits. In pediatrics, this is typically starting after two weeks. We don't do it right away. Like we said, those mood changes take a little bit of time, but it's not uncommon that moms don't see their OB until about that two weeks, anywhere between two weeks and six weeks. Um, So making sure that we're reaching out if if we're having issues. Mm -hmm. So we do have a question. So how can we tell the difference between baby blues and postpartum depression or postpartum anxiety? That is a great question. And really, when you're starting to feel those symptoms, you can't. So sometimes those diagnoses are more, like we said, time based. So baby blues are very common around day two to day three that they start. They usually peak around between day five and day seven. And then they're usually better or gone by about two weeks. But when you're kind of in that process, you don't 
you don't really know. And so if you're having significant symptoms that are very different from you, the safe thing to do is to reach out to people around you to say, I'm really struggling with this. Um, so your support people are keeping an eye on you. Maybe your care provider wants to see you sooner rather than later, but it is very difficult to know right after kind of where you fall in it. Are these just fleeting symptoms that will go away? Um, or is this something it's two weeks in and I still feel exactly the same and I'm really struggling? That would be kind of the differentiating factor. Um, and especially if you're feeling very out of your skin and these are symptoms you haven't had before, waiting two weeks sounds like a very, very long time. And so I would encourage you to reach out. And like we said, the most important thing that kind of separates those two, any thoughts or feelings of wanting to hurt yourself or hurt your baby, those are symptoms that do not go along with baby blues. Those are serious symptoms. It can be very hard to communicate those to people, um, but, you, but you need to try and do that. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. Thank you for talking on such an important topic too. And you know, learning more about this as we prepare for baby and help our support mm -hmm. system around us prepare for baby, I think can definitely help. So it doesn't, you know, all come up at once after you've mm -hmm. delivered. So, yes. So. Okay. So what do you wish that you would have known about the postpartum experience and prioritizing self-care after baby? Oh my gosh, everything, pretty much everything that I talked about during this talk, a lot of them are, some of them I know, but a lot of them were things like, man, if only I knew that this is what I wish I knew. And we've talked about a lot of that. So that's great. I think the things that were surprising to me, and I've already said this, um, the importance of sleep, especially after a long labor and delivery, I was so, so tired and did not prioritize sleep in that first week. And then that makes everything just that more, yeah. much more difficult going forward. Um, so I, in my thoughts, I was a resident um, when I had my baby. I was used to 70 hour work weeks. I was used to 12 hour shifts, sometimes 28 hour shifts on a bad month. Um, and I thought I could handle sleep deprivation. This is not, this is not that. This is entirely different for all the reasons we talked about with newborn sleep. Um, and that sleep on top of the stress that you already have of being a new parent or welcoming a new baby to your family, even if you already have a child, I, I, I keep thinking in my head, you know, for moms who have already had a baby and been there, parents I know talk about all the time that um, they haven't had a baby in a couple of years and you almost forget what it's like to have a baby in the home. And then on top of that, maybe you have other children and now you have to meet their needs and a new baby's needs. So all of these stresses just make lack of sleep that much, much more stressful. So it's super important. Um, and we've talked about this too, but asking for help when you need it. Um, I was very lucky to have a good support system of family and friends and fellow moms. So other people who had had kids too, um, to kind of tap into when I was a first time mom. Um, but I am a person who's very used to doing everything myself and being on top of things not really asking for help. And I didn't realize I should be asking for help some of those times. Um, so if you have people around you who are, who are helpful in those ways, do not be scared to ask them for help or tell them truthfully what you need. You are not a bad mom or a bad parent if you can't do it all and you need a break for your mental health and to prioritize those things that we talked about being so important. Um, and if you don't have a good support system, there, there are a lot of people who don't, whether you're away from home or this is just a difficult time. Um, this is where your providers and your healthcare community can really help you get plugged in and find resources where you may need them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we did have a question asking about where moms can find resources. So would you recommend checking in with your pediatrician and your OB for those? I would. Yes, I would. Um, so it kind of depends on the resources. So one of the biggest things in terms of, so Boys Town has resources that they can offer, but also just plugging you in and finding out what those are. So you have to do a little bit less of the guesswork and the legwork. Um, lactation support is a huge thing that we see for moms at our clinic as pediatricians. And so most of our local hospital systems have lactation consultants available after you leave the hospital, whether that's UNMC or Methodist or the CHI system, they pretty much all have lactation consultants that can either meet with you virtually or in person to address concerns that you have after the hospital. In the hospital, they are there all the time to help you with questions. And I highly encourage you to take advantage of having them there with you to come and help you while you're in the hospital. Um, so like we said, personal appointments, but there's a lot of breastfeeding support groups as well. COVID sometimes changes what this looks like. Um, so I'm not entirely sure what all of them are doing currently, but CHI has their baby talk sessions. Um, during the week um, in person, UNMC has latch and learn sessions where they do weighted feeds and then latch assistance and kind of things in more of a group setting. 
Um, Methodist Women's has breastfeeding classes, so prenatal ones, um, a breastfeeding basics class, a back to work breastfeeding virtual class, lots of different resources that you can tap into and a lot of them virtually. So yeah. you don't have to go in person, um, which is really nice. And I know Methodist did a good job of that too during the pandemic of offering those prenatal and breastfeeding basics classes before baby even gets there so you kind of know what to expect. Um, other local resources would be like La Leche League, which Omaha has a chapter of. This is like a common breastfeeding support um, group nationally. We also have Milk Works here in Omaha. That's over in Rockbrook Village. They have a Lincoln location as well, but they are an excellent resource for us here in Omaha. They have a breastfeeding boutique. They have lactation consultants that can meet with you one on one. They have scales that you can come in and weigh your baby on if you want to see how they're doing weight gain wise. Um, so lots of different resources. Um, we also have Natural Healthy Kids here in Omaha. Dr. Laura Wilwording is there and she does a lot of breastfeeding medicine and latching assistance. She also does phrenotomies if babies are tongue tied. So that's something to consider, um, but she's a resource. And then we also have Nebraska Women, Infants and Children or WIC, something, a resource that our families would need to qualify for, but something that's also available. There are also a lot of online resources for breastfeeding support. Um, one of my favorite ones is kellymom.com. Mm -hmm. um, Maybe we can kind of hand that out too, but they just have any question you have about breastfeeding and you can even just Google it. Um, I was on that website like nonstop, I think the first couple of weeks. Yeah. Um, but they, any question you would want to know, why is this happening? What do I do for this? Mastitis, plug duct, all of those questions. And they're right there at your fingertips. So you can read it two o'clock in the morning when you're, you know, trying right. to figure stuff out. Yeah. Um, so lactation support is a huge thing um, for moms. Another one is mental health support. So Boys Town does have behavioral health referrals, both for adults and for families. So that's something that we do offer through Boys Town, not just pediatrics. Um, there's also a great postpartum uh, support resource list um, through Milk Work. So a lot of our local resources, their support um, resources available online if you search for it, but they have support groups through Milk Works that are breastfeeding support groups. They're also local groups. Um, either for postpartum in general, for moms that had cesarean sections, um, lots of different things that we can tap into if we're looking for, for support people. Um, there's also on that resource, a list of local providers and counselors who specialize in postpartum mental health and health care. There's also a list of local wellness groups for moms. So if you're wanting to get back and do activity or like a walking group or anything like that, they have that all available through that resource. That's super helpful for, for women in our community. Um, and then another thing that Boys Town offers is obviously help with social work and support services. So we have several social workers through Boys Town as part of our team that help coordinate um, to get families in touch with the resources they need. And a lot of those services um, don't necessarily need referral, but we can obviously help kind of coordinate getting those resources that we need. Um, some of the, the most helpful ones here in the Omaha area we talked about were WIC for food and nutrition assistance programming, so formula and those kinds of things for a baby. Um, the Food Bank of the Heartland offers food assistance. Um, DHHS Access Nebraska is kind of our go-to for help with federal assistance programs, so SNAP and Medicaid and those kinds of things. There's also the Nebraska Family Helpline for parenting support and counseling. And then the Women's Center for Advancement is another great local resources for assistance of victims of violence or abuse. Um, so lots of different things in our community that may be just needing to get plugged into to offer that support that we need during this period. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for sharing all those. Those are super helpful. Yeah. So before we get into the questions in the comment section, I do have one more question for you. So if you're watching live and you haven't commented yet for the giveaway, or if you have a final question for Dr. Gillespie, now is the time to drop a comment and like this video while you're at it. Okay, so Dr. Gillespie, we've had you on for two talks this week. It's been great. How can parents get in contact with you if they want to request a meet and greet or get you looped in as their pediatrician for their new baby or other? Yeah, babies? absolutely. So I'm newer to the Boys Town family, but I'm currently seeing patients at our Pacific Street Clinic, which is at about 144th and Pacific. Um, I'm also scheduling meet the doctor appointments, both in person and via telehealth for expecting parents. Typically what we do during those is we talk about what to expect at the hospital. And then through that first year of life, really through the first couple of years of life in terms of what your pediatrician is doing and, and what we help manage. Um, and then we can also answer any parenting questions that you have or about how I practice to make sure that we're a good fit. 
Um, so those are all available right now. Um, and to schedule one of those appointments, you would be calling um, Boys Town at 531-355-6900. Um, so that's what I'm currently doing. And then I am scheduled to move out to the new Northwest Clinic that we are opening at 168th and Maple in April of this year. Cool. So I will still be at Pacific Street for a little bit, but that is where my home will be in the spring of this year. Yeah, that's exciting. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, so let's see some of these questions in our comment section here. Do you recommend using the services of a postpartum doula to help with a period right after baby is born? Um, I think that if that is, that is not something I have personal experience with, but if it's something that you're interested in, I don't think there's any harm in having more support people involved in this process. Like we kind of talked about, it takes a village to, you know, have a child and raise a child. It also takes a village to get through this postpartum period. Um, so if that's something that you're considering and you feel like it'd be helpful to have another person to kind of support you through this process, by all means, I think that it would be beneficial. Um, like I said, I don't have personal experience with it, but I, I can only imagine that more heads um, and more help during this process is, is a benefit. Definitely. We have a question from a dad tuning in. Thanks for watching. What are some of the more overlooked things that new dads can help can do to help new moms? Yes, what a great question. Um, I think uh, a lot of times for new dads, this this can be a hard process, this, this initial postpartum period. Um, so dads are not immune to the sleep deprivation. Um, and it can be really hard uh, to watch your partner, especially if your partner's like the breastfeeding parent, um, kind of struggle and have difficulty and stress and you feel like you're not able to help because um, you can't you can't feed the baby if mom's breastfeeding yeah. and we get that. Um, so helpful things are some of those other little things that maybe while mom is taking care of those things that she has to take care of with baby that dad is doing. So whether that's little things around the house that maybe need to get done and mom doesn't have to time to do it. For breastfeeding moms, really for all moms, um, being helpful and kind of knowing what mom needs. So we talked through the nutrition fluids, medicine early on, supplies. Sometimes it's just helpful to have all of those things there and help mom get set up to, to breastfeed or to do these things that she needs to do. Um, you know, seeing, seeing that she's breastfeeding, say, hey, I see your water there. Can I go fill it up for you or just fill it up? Getting lunch ready, getting meals ready um, so that the food is there and ready. Um, those little things, I think, make a huge difference in terms of, of a parenting team. Mm -hmm. um, it will kind of depend on what is working for you guys. I think, especially for breastfeeding parents, one of the big things is overnight mom is getting up to feed and, and dad maybe doesn't need to. And so sometimes you get that extra bit of sleep so that you can kind of get started doing things in the morning if mom's able to sleep in even. Yeah. Or maybe you get baby up after after mom feeds and then mom goes to take another nap and you kind of are on baby duty early in the morning. Whatever kind of works for you guys, but just that open and honest communication and even just saying, what can I do to help? can be a huge help. Yeah. Do you recommend having formula on hand when starting breastfeeding in case milk doesn't come in fast enough? Ooh, that's a really good question. Um, it never hurts. Okay. So for um, that question, it is, it is a difficult process sometimes for milk to come in and get established. And it's not a one size fits all, but it's not uncommon that we don't see mom's milk really come in until somewhere between day three or day five or six after baby is born. And so sometimes what you'll see, and for the most part, I think clinics have some extra formula supplies to give parents those things. So you're not having to run out to the store and figure out what formula to buy. Um, but if you have the option of having some at home, it's typically just you know a basic newborn formula of that Enfamil or Similac or the two name brands that are most common um, to have it. So if you are supplementing, um, you have it there and you don't really have to worry about finding a bottle or finding formula. It is nice to have that. Um, and even for breastfeeding families, you might find ways to, to use that later on, whether it's like putting it in the diaper bag if you don't want to have to bring milk or right. mixing it into oatmeal or other things that you can do with it later on. So it typically doesn't go to waste. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Is there a milk warmer that you would recommend? There are so many brands out there. Oh my gosh, there are. I'm trying to think of, I mean, <laughs> I know what we had. I think we had a munchkin. Okay. Um, and it worked. It worked. Like I said, you don't have to have it. I mean, you yeah. can totally, for 
I think we thought about at the beginning doing just like we have a big bubba and you just put it in there. It's just so much faster to have the warmer, especially for like middle of the night stuff. Some of it might just depend on your baby though. Some babies don't care if it's warm or not and they'll just take it cold and you never need it. Um, but it is a nice thing to have if you're, if you're worried about it, just to speed up the process. Um, I'm a firm believer in reading the reviews on things. So if something has a lot of somewhere between four and five star reviews, that's usually good enough for me. Baby list usually has a pretty good list of different products and how they would rank them. And I used a lot of baby list stuff too. Awesome. Can you use tap water with formula? You can, yes. You do not have to use bottled water. You can if you would prefer to. Um, I think the one caveat to that is just knowing what your water supply is. So um, if you're using like well water or rural water, it might be better to use bottled. But for the most part, the fluoride that is in your tap water is perfectly safe within our city limits to be using for making your bottles. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll do a couple more here and then we'll announce the giveaway. The next question is... What do you have any rec recommendations for products or supplements for postpartum postpartum hair loss? Oh my gosh, um, no. Yeah, that's okay. I think, <laughs> and then I, think I know that's a great question. And I think yeah. so for context, typically that postpartum hair loss is baby baby almost has it too if baby's going to lose some hair, but it's usually around like month four. It's usually around four months postpartum. So you've kind of gotten through a lot of stuff. And then if you're going to notice significant hair loss, that's when you notice it. Um, I think collagen containing products are always recommended for like skin and hair benefits. So any of those gummies, um, if you have any of those, would not be unsafe to use. Um, I think if you're noticing really significant changes, like a lot of hair loss along with other symptoms, again, these are funny things to say out loud as a postpartum mom because you're like, oh, the symptoms like my body temperature is off and I'm cold and I'm fatigued and my hair is falling out, which is most of us. Yeah. Um, it is important to communicate that with your care provider because there can be changes in your thyroid after pregnancy as well. And some of those symptoms might be related to hypothyroidism. It's something to keep in mind. It is a very common thing that happens after delivery. And the main reason is that when you go through the delivery process, um, it's a specific process called uh, telogen effluvium where the hairs that you had at that time, they all just kind of stop at the same time. So they all fall out at the same time, if that makes sense. Yeah. So it's normal. Collagen is usually pretty safe, um, but there's not like a, a magic fix for it, unfortunately. I still have baby hairs over here. Coming in. <laughs> okay, we'll do one more question. This is a good one. Is there anything that can help moms when baby starts daycare and she is going back to work from an emotional and self-care standpoint? Oh, let's see. Um, I think that is, it's a, it's a hard transition process, I think, to go from being at home with baby to knowing that you're, you know, leaving baby with someone else. Um, I think it kind of depends on, you know, where baby is going. So like, like this question said, you know, daycare, if that might be another thing that we can hopefully take care of before baby is even here is finding daycare and finding a spot and making sure we like and trust the place that they're going. I think that's huge. Um, feeling, you know, confident in who's going to be taking care of your child. Um, I think in terms of, you know, feeding, sometimes parents worry about feeding, especially breastfeeding moms. Like what, what am I going to do? What is baby going to do? Um, I think, for breastfeeding moms getting back to work, making sure or trying, um, having them take a bottle before you're leaving with other people is a is a helpful piece. Um, you typically don't wanna do that too early, but usually anywhere between like four and six weeks is okay to try and start maybe introducing a bottle to see if they're able to take it with dad um, or someone else, not mom. Um, so that can kind of ease your mind knowing that baby will be able to eat and that you are confident in where they're going. But it is a hard process. Um, sometimes when you're going back to work, if that means you're going to be pumping and you have the opportunity to do so, that's finding a nice self-care thing to do while you're pumping. Um, so whether that's music that you like to listen to or watching an episode of a show um, that kind of recenters you or makes you laugh or whatever it is that you yeah. make you feel better about it. But it is it is a really a it is a really hard 
um, transition, I think for most moms to kind of say, okay, we've been here together and now we're going to do this and it's going to look different again. So, yeah, maybe we can do a live just on that topic here in the future. Oh my gosh. Yeah. (laughs) Cause I'm sure we could go into it for a long time. Oh yeah. All right. Perfect. So let's go ahead and run this giveaway. Thank you all for tuning in and leaving comments and liking this video. It's so great to know that this has helped so many of you and uh, makes us feel good too. So, okay. We're giving away that car seat. We got a lot of good comments here. Day seven. Can you believe it? All right. Oh, Evelyn C, you are our winner. So congrats. We'll send you an email on how to claim your prize. And we do have one more video tonight with Dr. Gillespie at six o'clock, and that's going to be building more on postpartum care for moms. So if you want to tune into that video, please do. It'll be on our page. And thank you all so much for such a a fantastic week, a fabulous week. So um, best of luck to all of you who are pregnant and are going to deliver. Congrats ahead of time. Congrats to all watching who recently had a baby. We are so happy for you. And we appreciate you tuning in. So thank you. Bye, guys.